uh, classified weapons program established, and Bob was instrumental in helping us while he was here at the Center for Electromechanics. Uh, Bob has been here at CEM for almost 20 years now. Prior to that, he was the head of the National Institute of Standards back in Washington, D.C., so he's been a dedicated public servant at the federal level, as well as working here now for almost 20 years at CEM. He's also a renowned, no kidding, renowned, Ph.D. level electrical engineer in his own right, sits on more boards, committees, and societies than I can name, and yet he's given the last almost 20 years to us here at the University of Texas. Uh, if you haven't been to Pickle Campus, don't know about the Center for Electromechanics, you should get up there and learn a little about them. They do some amazing, fantastic, cutting edge and often bleeding edge technological work up there, not only in energy generation and storage, but alternative energy means of transportation and other things. So uh, I'm not going to read his bio because you've all got it. I'd really like to get him some time to get up here and talk to you all. But I think he's going to give you a really fascinating talk. And he certainly knows what he's talking about. So if you want to go in the weeds technically, please dive right down. He's got about 45 minutes, sir, and then we'll try to reserve a good 15, 20 minutes for questions. Bob, I'll turn it off to you. Thank you, Fred. Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, very pleased to be here with you this afternoon, and I'm going to try to give you a um, uh, somewhat educational, somewhat entertaining uh, 45 minutes uh, walk through a view of um, part of the electricity uh, problems and opportunities that we have facing us. Uh, the outcome that I hope to have from this discussion is that um, we will, you'll understand why I gave this answer to this test question. The test question is the fairest method to compensate the owners of rooftop solar panels is via net metering. That means we, we, we pay them as much as we would charge them uh, if they were buying the electricity. And my answer is, is it's a true-false question and it's all of the above. And what I want to do is walk you through why it's a good all of the above rather than true or false. Uh, so we're going to look at this um, of how we get to the cost of electricity uh, at the retail level in a variety of ways and what the implications are. And I hope that at the end of the time you will be uh, smarter and happier. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about metrology. Uh, and I, I will frankly confess that I never re remember hearing the word metrology in all of my time in college. I, I, I phrased that carefully. I didn't always pay the closest of attention. Somebody may have said it, and I may have missed it. But uh, realistically, it wasn't until I left the university that I ever lear learned that there was a metrology, which is a science of measurements. And it can really be boring. I mean, this is when people spend their entire life uh, to get the 10th uh, significant digit for a, uh, a physical quantity, and they get excited about why the 10th digit is even more, they, they, why they were able to do it. Uh, it's, it's really important stuff, but I'm going to try to focus on the parts here that are non-boring. What I want to focus on is the fact that measurements make a difference. And the uh, two quotes I put here, one is that you get what you measure. And this is for those folks who are uh, looking for business as a career. Uh, the quality, this is a mantra of the uh, quality movements, that uh, if you take your company and you measure the right things, you'll get the right outputs. If you measure the wrong things, you'll get improvements in the wrong things. So what you, you, you have to be careful about what you measure in your company, because what you measure is what you're going to get. The engineers look at it a different way. They say, that their, their look at this is, you can't control what you can't measure. And that's because in control, if you have a system, if you don't know what it's doing, you can't correct for what it's doing. So you really need to be able to have, that, uh, have the measurements to be able to control it. The reason why this is important, and the reason that I spent much of my career in this area, is we spend over a trillion dollars in the United States based on measurements. You buy a gallon of milk for $5. You assume there's a gallon. Uh, there's been many times in our history that it is not. Uh, but you're assuming it's a gallon. When you buy gasoline, you're assuming it's a gallon. When you buy land, you're assuming that you can measure an acre. Uh, you, you, you measure dollars per something, and it's a per something. And it's not just, uh, it's, it's not new. Uh, in the, uh, uh, what, the Warring States period in China, which I think was about uh, 300 years B.C., uh, they, they, had, they introduced a system because people were cheating on weights and measures. Uh, those of you who uh, have read your Christian Bible, uh, they have a section in there about making sure you have honest weights and measures so you don't cheat people. So we've been cheating people on, uh, by, with weights and measures for the history of mankind. And that's why we have uh, measurement systems at work. I, I, wanted, I, I put this silly scale up here because it... Um, 
Tell us about, it, it reminded me when I ran across the picture of how I got into this whole area and it's actually a, a pretty good uh, thought uh, process before we get into electricity. That scale is called a cotton scale. And it was called a cotton scale because back in the old days, before we had machines picking cotton, the way we picked cotton was you put a, a cloth sack over your shoulder and you walked through the field, you pulled the cotton off and you threw it in the bag. I did that for a summer. I was really bad at it. I hated picking cotton. I couldn't make enough money. But uh, what happens is when you uh, fill the, the, your bag, you pour it in the trailer. Uh, when the trailer gets full, the uh, farmer drives it to the nearest cotton gin and uh, they uh, compress it. Well, the next year I said, you know, I'm a whole lot better with machines than I am with plants, so I'm going to work in the gin. So I worked in the cotton gin in which I found out nobody trusts that scale. If you're picking cotton, and uh, you spent your whole day out there sweating, and the farmer's going to weigh your bag. The farmer's going to want to have that bag weigh a little less than it really does. Uh, you're going to want to put some rocks in it, so it weighs more than it really does. So what happens is they take it to the gin, they suck all the cotton out and weigh the, weigh the cotton, uh, and then they, uh, what would happen is my job as a 16-year-old kid between this uh, farmer and the, uh, the, the team of migrant workers would to be renormalized every weight and calculate how much everybody got. The farmer gets this much, the brewery gets that much, but the, the independent third party which calibrated the field scale was me at the gin. And that's when I first learned that, you know, you can have in, in, incorrect measurements, but they can be pretty valuable. And that's what we ended up with is a, a very valuable incorrect measurement system. We built a measurement system that worked in the real world where you do your arithmetic on the, on the uh, hood of a pickup truck. And <sighs> I'm going to talk, I talk a lot about good measurements, but I really don't want to get you into a position where you think that, the, that we measure everything accurately. When we measure a gallon of, uh, for, for gasoline, we measure that really accurately. We can measure it to a Nat's eyelash. However, back when I was younger and we had done some significant work on um, uh, electronics, we, had, we did some work that really helped the U.S. be competitive worldwide. And we got this bright idea, why don't we look at the balance of trade? and see if we can't see in the electronic sector, uh, six months after we did this, we start seeing it stepping up where the balance of trade becomes positive for the United States. Because if any of you who pay attention now understand that it's a, a, gross, a, a great problem of balance of trade. Well, it always has been. And, but we wanted to see that we were really making a difference in balance of trade. So we went and got all the numbers, and we looked at them and said, we can't decide anything. The variation month to month and year to year is smaller than the number of significant digits in all the data coming in. There is no way you can infer anything mathematically rigorously from this data. Our balance of trade is based on uh, you know, shaking dead chickens over a bunch of numbers. It, it doesn't make any sense. And so we called the people who kept the statistics. And they said, yeah. And we said, well, why don't you change them? And they said, we can't. Everybody likes them. They're related in some way to what happens. We, we absolutely agree there's nothing mathematically rigorous about our balance of trade. But they, over time, they tend to sort of go the right direction, and people change their business practices in ways that make sense. And yes, they're not mathematically rigorous, but that's what's there. And no, you certainly could never uh, see that any one action made any uh, effect, because we don't know why, it's follow, why it does what it does. So we have a measurement. The measurement makes a difference sort of the right way, but we don't have any idea why. Well, you're going to see that in our measurement of electricity, we've got some really good measurements, but there's a whole lot of other stuff going on here, too. So um, we're going to see how we can get better, but we're not bad. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of normalization here to make sure everyone understands about electricity. The first thing you have to understand is that your local utility is not Google. It's not Microsoft. It, doesn't, it can't make its money on its own. It is the investor-owned utilities are totally constrained by us, the public, through our elected officials, through our market setups, through our regulations. We tell the electricity what the, uh, the utilities they can do, and we tell them the maximum profit they can make. If they're really good, you can make up to this much profit. So they don't make up what they want to do. They don't develop new innovation. We tell them what innovation they can make. They may suggest them. They have people in the field who are working every day say, hey, this is a good idea, and they can suggest it. But it's really up to us through our elected representatives, uh, or appointed representatives, that actually decide uh, what they get to do. So 
to a very large extent, we control what the utility does. And that's why I always get annoyed with uh, a recent headline I saw, for example, that said that uh, uh, the people want solar power faster than the utilities want to give it. No, they don't. The utilities will do whatever you tell them to. The question is, how do we make this whole thing work? So we've got to keep in mind that uh, the utility is not the enemy here. They actually do what we want them to do. Uh, but we're not real coherent about telling them what we want them to do. What we want them to do is give us the lowest price of electricity possible that is always on. Oh, and by the way, uh, make it perfectly clean and perfect forever. And uh, if we could do that, it's, we're, we're all happy with the, our, our local utility. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't told them how to do that. Um, the other thing that is going to come back at the end, so I want to introduce the concept now, is that since the utilities are largely controlled by, the, um, by governments, um, there's this interesting dichotomy that goes, goes on. The government tries to push as much as they can into the electricity rate and let the ratepayers pay for it. And the utilities want to push as much into the government to let the taxpayers pay for it. Now what we're arguing over is who gets blamed and who collects the money. Because if I look out across the United States and I try to figure out all those people who pay for electricity and don't pay taxes, that's a pretty small number. Or all those people who pay taxes and don't pay electricity, it's all the same people who pay. It's just a question of who gets blamed for it. So we have a, um, uh, th that will come back and I'll give you a very specific examples of that at the end. Now let's get on to electricity. I gave this long introduction without getting you into electricity. So. We buy electricity in kilowatt hours, and across the country, we pay a whole lot of different prices for that, depending upon what's possible to get the uh, lowest price electricity, and we'll talk about why it varies across the country. Um, what I wanted to point out, though, is that uh, about oh, half, over, over a half century ago, we agreed on how we're going to measure electricity. For the first uh, 30 or 40 years that we had electricity in the um, United States, there were a whole range of meters, and we couldn't figure out how we're going to measure it. And we finally settled on a meter that looked like it's really going to work. This electromechanical meter is really just a motor with a constant drag on it so that it turns very slowly when I run power through it. And as I can count the revolutions. If I count the revolutions, I know how much power went through it. Uh, they were really cheap. They're really reliable. Uh, they're, they're great. And then we invented the electronic meter. So we can do all of that electronically and do it. We can get much more data, much more information. At that point, I was probably closer in age to the average in this room than I was at my age now. And I had my first job of trying to figure out, I had to change the way we calibrated meters. Because these electromechanical meters that you see over there on this side, um, they're, they are motors. So they change with time. They get dirty. The bearings get, uh, get worn. Uh, they can change a little bit. And what we did is we had this wonderful system that we, um, uh, I won't go into the whole system. I don't need to. But what happened is that the, um, uh, we, we, we had to calibrate them periodically. And so we had a system in place that they were all sent to the uh, National Bureau of Standards where I was working, and I was responsible for making sure that we could calibrate them all. We had to upgrade our system. And I was, wor I was uh, concerned, well, I was excited about the new electronic meters coming out. Uh, but I went to the uh, peers in the, the uh, industry because I was a young guy, and I went to people who didn't look like me. They'd been in the industry a long time, and they'd put their arm around my shoulder and say, hey, Bob, these electromechanical meters, they last 25 years, they cost $25. The electronics are never going to take them over. And I said, gee, I hear you. So I went home, and we built a new calibration system for electromechanical meters. But I didn't really believe them, so I built the same, a similar one for electronic meters. We put them both online at the same time. After they went online, we calibrated exactly two electromechanical meters. Everything had become electronic, even though all the uh, gray beards in the industry had told me that it wasn't going to happen. So there's a, and I, and in just a moment, which is probably the next slide. No. Um, won't, I, I, I'm going to come back to tell you why. But what really happened is it made, that's made a, a massive change. We're talking about smart grid, all our smart electronic meters. This was all happened because we could change. We found a way to change the uh, electromechanical meters. But before I go into how and why, I need to give you a little bit of a, a technology digression. So those of you who are engineers are going to be bored. Uh, because they, this is too easy. Uh, for those of you who hate uh, math and equations, this is going to be too uh, sophisticated. But anyway, I, I got to get a little bit of uh, knowledge to everybody here. So first we have AC versus DC. So that was a fight that we had around 1900 between Westinghouse and Tesla. That's when Tesla was a person, not a car. And uh, Thomas Edison. Um, 
And AC, because Edison built his first neat power plant that was DC. Uh, Westinghouse and Tesla built AC. AC was working better. Uh, Edison was getting desperate. Finally, uh, Westinghouse won. And uh, the thing I like about the gentlemanly way people fought at that time, uh, as it looks like Westinghouse was going to win, Edison took out a publicity campaign to put a word on the act of electrocuting someone in an electric chair. He wanted to say that person has been Westinghoused just to show how dangerous AC electricity was. Uh, it didn't catch on, but, but Westinghouse's electricity did, and uh, both Edison and, and uh, uh, Westinghouse became famous and rich. But AC won the 20th century. But DC is coming back. DC means it just it doesn't change over time. The AC is what we see here uh, that runs, this is where I wanted my pencil. Uh, you're right, it didn't work well here. Um, the AC changes, reverses polarity with time. It changes all the time. This is the kind of vo voltage that really you want to get up, that the generators want to produce. So if I have a big generator run off natural gas or hydropower or a nuclear plant, this is the electricity it likes to produce. Uh, if I have things like solar panels, batteries, uh, and that's what they, they like to produce, the DC, which doesn't change at all, and the electronic loads tend to like those. I'll also admit that over the last 100 years, electrical engineers have become incredibly adept in moving one, changing them back and forth. So it doesn't matter how you start, you can, you can end up either way. Um, the other thing about AC, though, is it has this little nuance that's going to come back and I, that will explain the uh, implication of uh, in, in more detail in a few minutes. But what it means, it, what the, the nuance is that in principle we'd like the voltage and the current, well, when it was designed, when we first built the system, they were in phase, which means the peak of the voltage happened at the same time as the peak of the current. Uh, and that's because we were using light bulbs and other resistive loads. And we started putting in more motors. What happened is the peak of the current happens later than the peak of the voltage. And so we have something, we have a phase shift, and that phase shift um, ends up with something that we call a power factor. And we'll see why that's true in a second. And the, the, what happens is, now the, these are the only three equations in here, so pay attention closely, uh, and they're all the same equation basically, but very simple. The power that you get from, that the meter reads, is the voltage through it, the, volt, the current, the voltage across it, the current through it, and the power factor. That's that cosine of the angle. Now the electronic meters don't measure the, the power factor, because they measure the instantaneous value, but they give you exactly the same number uh, with the cos without the cosine. DC, all you need to have is the voltage and the current. Um, now, this is the, with that little bit of a background, the elect go back to the electromechanical meter, uh, it historically, we were able to calibrate it uh, and reliably uh, to within about uh, a hundredth of a percent, uh, well, about a tenth of a percent reliably, uh, near a hundredth of a percent reliably, a uh, tenth of a percent routinely. So it was very, very easy to make a very accurate mechanical meter. Um, and the interesting thing about it, and you'll, this will actually become apparent as we get into here is why, uh, most of the utilities calibrated them so that the meters cheated them a little bit. And the fundamental reason for doing that is they could get their money back in other ways, and if it moved a little, they weren't going to get sued. Uh, so it was enough for them to consider it de minimis, so they'd actually cheat a little bit. And uh, those, you're all probably too young to remember Ralph Nader, but Ralph Nader was a consumer advocate who actually ran for president. He... Um, wrote a book, Unsafe at Any Speed, uh, told about how bad Corvairs were. My first car was a Corvair and I loved it. Uh, but Ralph Nader was, made his reputation by investigating uh, rip-offs of consumers. And I had his team come visit me because they assumed that there was probably a, uh, a, a, a story, that they get to, a new book on how the electric utilities are ripping off the consumers. And then I explained to them that yes, the meters can go bad, but, you know, we, we, we've understood how well that works, and we can statistically sample. And we, we take people's meters off people's house all the time and see how well they work. And the utility takes it back to their meter lab and, uh, and checks how well it works, or checks to see if it's accurate. But then how does the meter lab know that it's accurate? Well, they compare with about eight or ten other utilities in continuous round robins in their area. So they know that they're all the same. But how do they know that that's accurate? Well, once a year they send them to the National Bureau of Standards and they come to my lab and we check them. So we have this entire system that's set up and it's set up uh, so it actually cheats the utilities. And after they probed that for a little while, they said, thank you very much, and they walked away. Uh, we had a highly robust system. The problem with that system is it cost a lot of money. 
And so what happened is we, when we, took, we went to the uh, uh, electronic meters, uh, we, the electronic meters don't fail that way. They either work or they don't. If I have 10 electronic meters and nine of them agree, they, they were calibrated once and nine of them agree and 10 of them is off and the 10th one's off by, a, won't be off by a hundredth of a percent, it'll be off, it won't turn on. It'll be off by a factor of two. I mean, it'll be obviously bad. So we were able to get rid of that whole system, saving you as customers millions of dollars a year. So we reduced the cost of power. But we still have a problem. Here we've got this wonderful electronics. The problem is that the real, the cost of power the, the real power that we measure, the thing that we read on the meter, is at best indirectly related to what we're charged. And that's what I want to talk about very quickly to see why that's true. The first one I want to do is, um, is uh, geography. It turns out that it's a whole lot cheaper, uh, as you might expect. Looking at that, a, map, a picture of uh, Texas that I owe to Dr. Beecher. He uh, got up one morning and, and, and sent it out there because it was such a cool picture showing the lights around Texas where you can see Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, uh, the uh, El Paso, all of Texas there. And, uh, but but it went, the reason I like the picture is it makes it real obvious that if I want to make money selling electricity without putting up much infrastructure, I certainly would like to do it in, uh, along I-35 corridor. And I certainly would hate to do it within 100 miles of Lubbock. There's, I, I can provide the electricity, but there's not enough customers there, and I still have to put up lines and, and, uh, and, and poles. The other thing, as a, dig as a digression, the other thing I find fascinating about this chart is that um, it shows <laughs> why, where Texas uses its electricity. Uh, we can, I mean, it's, it's too hard to see. Uh, you, but, if you, but those of you who know where they are can see the lights at both the Permian Basin and Eagleford Shale. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of lighting going on uh, where we're extracting oil and gas from the ground. In addition to that, we have cities, but uh, geographically, uh, it's the oils that, that fill up all those empty spaces. So it's a, an interesting picture, but the, um, we, 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 we developed this system to provide electricity. We did it where it was cheapest, but what happened is sparsely populated areas didn't get any electricity. And so what we did in, as the as United States, we invented uh, the electric co-ops the Rural Electrification Administration. And I have to say that as a person whose um, dad worked for an uh, investor-owned utility, I would get at least one piece of mail a, day, a, a month uh, at our house telling me that the uh, REA was basically breeding communists and the end of the United States was going to be because we found a way of uh, subsidizing power to get to the farmers. But at the end of the day, it, it, it helped us all a lot. And so we've, we've been able to get power, ubiquitous power through the United States, rising the, raising the uh, income level and the quality of life for everybody. So it's, a, it's been a really good thing. Uh, one thing I've noticed in my, uh, lately is Alaska joined too late. We spend a lot of time with Alaskan villages who just can't get power. Uh, it, it's, it's too big a state, it's too rugged, uh, without enough natural resources. Uh, you say, well, hydropower is great when I go there in the summer, but in the wintertime, hydropower doesn't work with the darn. Uh, so it's, um, it, it's a, it's, they have their own problems. The other thing that we have, that we have to keep up uh, aware of is that th we, we live, um, we are very lucky that we have power to everyone. Uh, the 2015 statistics uh, from the World Bank, which I'm not sure I believe are quite this bad, but they're, uh, they're pretty ugly. 70% uh, of the people in Sub-Saharan Africa own cell phones, but only about a third have access to a, to a grid. And if they don't have access to a grid, yeah, they can put up a solar panel to charge their phone, but you have to have an infrastructure. You have to have a refrigerator. You have to be able to run a pump to pump water. And once you can make those kind of changes in a, uh, in, uh, in a community, you can then start raising the, the uh, standard of living in that whole community. I will admit that the paper that I've written that has been read the most, I actually wrote with a colleague from India, which is a very simple paper about saying how you take your solar panels and put together a 48 volt system in a, uh, uh, a village. And here's where you put the protection, but then you can go buy a camping refrigerator and the village can have a refrigerator. And it goes on and on. And it was a, intellectually, it was a very pedestrian paper. It hasn't been reviewed, it hasn't been referenced often, but it's been read over and over and over. Real people are reading it, trying to figure out how to make their lives better. And I'm sort of proud of that. I, w I would have never written that paper. I have to admit, the, uh, the, the student from India said, we have to write this paper. I said, okay, you write the paper, I'll edit it. Uh, we'll send it in and see if it gets accepted. And it did, and it's been remarkable. So I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we can do little things that can really make a difference in the rest of the world. 
and it has to do with how do you get electricity. Okay, the other thing we have a problem with is which I, was the thing that I, it, that I, before I distracted myself, we have this problem with geographical dis differences. And how do we address those in billing? How do I say because you live outside of town, you have to pay more? No, I don't really do that. What I say is we have an infrastructure. However, if you live too far from the infrastructure, which is defined by each utility, uh, we're going to charge you more for putting, out, uh, putting up your poles and lines to do that. And what happens is uh, I stole this picture from a real estate ad. And they were, they were, one of the advantages of this ranch that was for sale is that the electric poles were on the road. So you, know, you had electricity close by, so it wouldn't cost you all that much to get your own power. So some people have to pay. The other geographical variations, what we do is we just sort of average them out. And so the amount you pay for electricity is the amount of the electricity you bought, plus some a little adder for all of the other, adder or subtractor, uh, to, for, to compensate for everybody else how far they are and how much infrastructure they need. So there is a geographical fee you pay for your power. Now let me get back to power factor. I introduced it, and now I'm going to tell you, and now, you know, you'll see why it, uh, why it is a problem. When meters were invented, all light bulbs were incandescent light bulbs. All loads were light bulbs, the first approximation. Uh, and uh, the power factor in the, in the world was one, and the meters were designed to measure unity power factor. Well, then we, we started powering motors and generators and air conditioning systems and the whole plethora of things that we do now. And the power factor started, and electronics really messed it up, but the power factor has shifted a lot. And what happens is the utilities just have to provide the full voltage and current, but the meter only records the... Uh, uh, voltage and current multiplied by the power factor. So if I get, if, if, you're, if you have a, a power factor of 0.5, that means you only get charged for half the power that you used. And that's probably not a good, then this is, a, I've turned up the contrast there a lot. I, there's a lot of nuance in that statement that's not there, just to make it clear. Uh, but what I want to do is give the always popular but totally wrong analogy for power factor. But it's popular because it involves beer. Um, what the, the, the lesson that the person who at first drew this wanted to show you is that the, um, if you have a large power factor, you end up having too much of a head on your beer. You really want just a small amount of head. But realistically, that's not a good analogy for what's going on. What's really going on is let's assume you're the bar, you own the bar. And you look around and you say, okay, I've got to buy glasses, I've got to buy beer, I've got to have staff, I've, I've got to have dishwashing, I've got to have insurance, I've got to have lighting, and I'm going to sell as many glasses of beer. So, okay, this is what my, my glass of beer is going to look like the one on the other side, and I'm going to, I'll put a, a price on it, and that's what I have to do. Now, with the power factor people come in, it would be like a customer coming in and say, okay, you sell great beer, I want your beer. However, I want my beer to have a big head on it. And oh, by the way, I only want to charge, I'm only going to pay uh, for what's real beer. I'm not going to pay for the head. And that means all of the, your calculations for everything you did for how much your beer should cost don't work anymore. You're being cheated as a, uh, as a utility. And I don't think so, unless you're a Guinness drinker, I don't know why you're so obsessive about the head either. But uh, it, it, that's, that's where this analogy comes from, is that somebody has to pay for that extra power that doesn't get measured by the meter. And how do we do that? The way we do it is the utilities take a look at who has bad power factors and they make them pay for it themselves. So they go back to my analogy, they say, I'm going to sell you this full, bottle of, full glass of beer and charge you a full, full glass of beer. If you want the big hit on it, put it on yourself. Uh, so that's the way we get around this. And so small power factors, we average. So what we do then is we say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll fix the big ones, but for the smaller ones where somebody's only cheating a little bit, we'll raise everybody's rate on the average. So then you're paid for what you um, to used, and you're paid for some you pay for some average geographical cost, and you pay for some average power factor cost. So you're you're ending up uh, suddenly your bill is starting to get a little more complex. And here's the, the next one that comes in is demand. Demand is a, a wonderful thing. I like demand. Demand means how much electricity you're using. What we see in this corner is 170. Uh, I mean se about 735 houses in the um, Miller development. We got this data from the Pecan State Project. Uh, and that's the demand that they're using. Almost all of them have, at over, over a 24-hour period, it's how much electricity they're using. Uh, almost all of them are about the same. There's a, some variation. Uh, the one at the very back side that is using a whole lot more than everybody else, that was, we had a lot of uh, fascination with that uh, data. We decided either someone is uh, putting in a lot of grow lights to grow an cr indoor crop that has high profitability, or someone is... Um, minting bitcoins, 
Or there may be a more mundane answer that was error in the data. But we have one house that's a real outlier from everybody else. Uh, and that's what you have is a, uh, when you end up with a strange demand. What we have in the lower corner on that side is the average for the development. And if you give a good engineer an average, a predictable average, they can come up with the optimal way of meeting that average. So if they don't have to meet everybody's variation and just meet the average, life is good. And that's a very nice average and things work very well. But almost everything works according to the average, but not everything does. And the, um, and we actually take, the utilities take advantage of that and you benefit from it. Uh, take the Mueller development again. Uh, they have about six to 10 houses. Well, every house is, 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 can take about 20 kilowatts. They have 110 volts, uh, 200 amp service. So they, they're nominally uh, 20 kilowatts. And we put six to 10 houses on a transformer. So you say, wow, that takes 120 kilowatts up to maybe 200 kilowatts for a transformer. No, it takes 50 to 75. Because what happens is nobody turns everything on at once all the time. If you wanted to blow up your transformer, you probably could if you and your neighbors would get together and say, let's see if we can't pull all of our power all at once. Uh, but what would you gain from that except blowing a fuse and you have to start over? So, but realistically, we don't do it. We take advantage of the statistics, we put in a cheaper transformer, and you pay less for power. That's a real advantage. However, there's things like this picture over here. Uh, I picked up a, this is a, a mega church in Indiana. Uh, maybe the office buildings used during the week, but that great big sanctuary in the front, uh, that's not used at all during the week. So on Sunday morning, somebody goes in and turns on the air conditioning as, as cold as they can get it because they're going to put 1,000 people in there. They're going to be singing and jumping around. And it's 95 degrees outside, and they're going to be dressed in their Sunday best. So you've got to get that thing cooled off. So for about four hours on a Sunday morning, that thing's drawing 20, 30 kilowatts uh, to get as much uh, cooling as they can. Then they turn it off, and it runs no power for the rest of the week. Uh, so they need much bigger infrastructure. And the uh, utilities and regulators scratched their head a bit and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put a demand charge on there. If you have a lot of demand, then we're going to charge you a little bit more because we're going to have to put more infrastructure there, and you'll pay for your own infrastructure. We won't ask for everybody else to do it. Great idea, right? And great ideas almost always work. I mean, what we're saying is that abnormal infrastructure will be compensated by a demand charge structure. Um, and what I... Okay, let me... the. I mean, I'm going to actually change my own talk in, in real time. Uh, but we're challenged today because what happens is if I put that demand charge on, I put it on wrong in a lot of places. So I can sell ancillary units that, that come in that uh, take the demand, um, that uh, fill that demand so I, I can fill it myself. I'll put a battery in there, and then I won't have that demand charge. And that's a good thing to do if the utility doesn't have to put in the infrastructure. But if it has the infrastructure and it only it, uh, it, it has to pay it anyway, then, then all the rest of you are paying for that person to put his battery in. So our accuracy is then, again, um, uh, I mean, our, our, our bill is then affected, not just by the, the electricity we use, but some sort of an average demand charge that we haven't compensated for properly, plus the geographical factors, uh, plus the power factor factors. So we've got these things coming in. Let me go quickly back to this. I want to make it clear that demand charge is not time of day charging. There's a, a lot of people talking about time of day rates, which means when the, we have a large demand, maybe we should charge more for electricity. And the, the, my personal bias is, is uh, a result of this particular chart. This is a chart of the electricity in uh, ERCOT, so basically Texas, uh, for, a, for, for a year, uh, given from the years 2017, 2011 through 2017. It's about the same. I, that's a nice predictable curve. I can hit that every time. Now what it does show is that for a few minutes, a few hours, I shouldn't say minutes, a few hours every year, the rates go way up. They can be 10 to 100 times what they are normally. And we get headlines that say, ooh, electricity rates have gone through the roof, we have to fix something. You know, the way we fix that is these are predictable. We get some economists, some good engineers in the room, and they say, okay, this is the most economic system we can use to do this. The other alternative that says, D, let's let the consumers be the ones to fix this for us, and let's let the consumers uh, change their demand, uh, and therefore we'll, we'll put a price penalty on when it goes up. So we can either have the utilities fix it, or we're going to have the consumers fix it. Historically, we've had the uh, utilities fix it. We're getting more and more pressure to let the consumers fix it. I'm personally very concerned about letting the consumers fix it, because I see it as, as again, uh, reinforcing income inequality. The consumers who are going to fix it are the more affluent, the more they have more time, and understand it better. The people who aren't going to fix it are the ones who are, are, are uh, uh, poorer, 
uh, less educated and don't worry about things like electricity. And so we're going to end up with the poor people having to pay more for electricity than the rich people. And I don't like that approach. But it is a very popular approach by some people. They tell me I'm wrong. The one that reinforced this on me, I was sitting on a uh, panel with the uh, CEO of, um, no, head of the board of directors of Walmart. And he, uh, during one of the breaks, he said to me, you realize that 19% of our customers do not understand the financial system well enough to own a checking account? And so if I have 19% of Walmart shoppers who can't, don't understand things well enough to be able to write a check, uh, how, how, are they going, how good are they going to be at dynamically adjusting demand uh, to meet uh, load changes? It just isn't going to happen. Okay, now... So we've, we looked at uh, the other the big factors, uh, the other factors, technology factors. Here's the big factor that affects uh, where, where, how much electricity costs. Uh, Austin Energy's rates are simply explained in a 50-page book. And they've done a good job. Uh, but if you go online, the book is 50 pages. Uh, but I, I do, I, I'm not criticizing Austin Energy. I mean, that's, that's what we've done to ourselves in rate structure. Um, they give you a base charge. This is how much your electricity costs. And then they say, oh, by the way, we also have an energy charge. <clears throat> and that energy charge says, we're going to pay more as we use more. Now, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to, from the utility point of view, because uh, they, it doesn't really cost them anymore to give you uh, more power than they were giving you before. So it's not a big deal to them. But what it does is, it, there's a couple of reasons why people might want to do this. What it says is the people who use more probably are the ones who are the most affluent, and they can charge a higher rate, and therefore they'll be subsidizing the people who use less, which are who are the poorer people, and therefore you have a progressive rate for your electricity, and the rich people pay more and the poor people pay less, and maybe that's a social outcome that you want to have. Or you can say that it's my job to make sure everybody uses less electricity. I don't care if it comes from the sun. We have all that we need. I think using less is always better. So what I'm going to do is the more you use, the more I'm going to charge you for it. And that's another social objective that we can decide we have. But that the bottom line is we, we pay different rates for the same electricity in the same system depending on how much we happen to use. Oh, and then we have a summer power supply charge and a non-summer power supply charge. I uh, thought those were fairly fascinating. Uh, but what it basically boils down to is I can't hit my base charge well enough and the fuels are going to cost different in different times and I'm going to put an adjustment in there. But then comes the, the more interesting social interests, and that is we put a consumer assistance program in. Uh, that means a number of things, I'm sure. One of the things I happen to know about is that we have a whole bunch of poor people in Austin. It gets hot in Austin. They run their air conditioners. They can't afford their electric bill. Uh, if they can't afford their electric bill, uh, Austin Energy puts them on a payment plan. What a payment plan means basically is they lend them money, uh, and the, that interest actually comes out of everybody else. And so they uh, because if they don't pay the bill, they can't get they can't uh, get electricity again, and they become homeless. And so we have this wonderfully vicious system that says if you can't pay your electric bill, you're homeless. Uh, and what, so we, so Austin Energy steps in and says, okay, we don't want that as an outcome. So we're gonna we're gonna have some customer assistance. Now we could have done that as taxpayers. Or we could do that as ratepayers. We've decided in the city of Austin we're going to do it as ratepayers. We also have uh, service area lighting. Somebody has to pay for the street lights. Well, we can either have the taxpayers pay for that, or we can have the ratepayers pay for that. We're going to have the ratepayers pay for that. Again, it's just, it's just who collects. Uh, you're paying for it. Uh, we have a, um, and the energy efficiency services. Uh, they will send people to your house to help you have more energy efficient, become more energy efficient. Uh, that's a good thing. And we also have a regulatory charge. The uh, utilities have to be regulated, and somebody has to pay for it, either the taxpayers or the ratepayers. Well, basically, you have to pay for it, and somebody has to collect it. So what we've ended up with is the, um, not only do we have geographical things that affect the rate, and uh, power factor things that affect the rate, and demand issues that affect the rate. We also have um, a, um, we've agreed that we're going to do some social good things that are also going to affect our rate. So that gets us to the fact that, okay, what really happens with an electric bill? The amount we get, we have an electric bill, is the accurately me metered real power. That's what the metrologists do. That's what I did for years. I'll give you that number. But then we're going to hang, hang on to that, all of these other uh, activities that go into that. And that's, I put lawyers in there, but it's lawyers and economists and businessmen working for your benefit decide what else to put in there to make it more fair. And there's a perception among the public that what we're paid for is, what we're charged for is the electricity we use. And we're charged for the electricity we use 
plus some average costs of a whole lot of other things, plus some things that have nothing to do with the electricity we use. So that's what comes into your electric bill. Um, and that takes me back to the beginning of the talk. Um, what's the fair rate to buy power from private rooftop solar? What rate, I know what rate I'm being charged when I buy electricity. What's the fair rate if I'm buying it from you? And we said, uh, I said net metering. It, it turns out, in my mind, it does, it's, a, it's not a technical issue that I can answer as a technologist. It's a social answer. I can give you a technical way of measuring it, but we've decided that we're going to do a whole lot of other things that are proportional to that electricity we buy. And it depends on how you want to apportion those in the future. And rooftop solar I picked because it's a great example. The, in the United States, rooftop solar is viewed as a net benefit, something we really want to have. Uh, and so many states and nationally, we have provided a subsidy for rooftop solar. And what does a subsidy, a, a government subsidy means? It means that if you want to have rooftop solar and the rest of us don't, we say it's important enough for the rest of you to have it that we're going to all give you a little bit of money so you can have rooftop solar. So we're taking our money and giving you some of it because we think that's a net good. And we have decided that that's what we've wanted to do for the last several years. Um, and, and Austin Energy uses a uh, net metering, and that base, that, in my, my gut tells me we're overpaying for the value we receive from net energy. So we're providing another subsidy for every month that you use it. So we're also deciding that it's so important that you have these solar panels that we're also willing to cut down your bill every month just so, you're, so you can be better. Um, and so that's what we have decided to do to get the spread of uh, solar panels. Now, if everybody had rooftop solar panels, uh, that the, the subsidy in your, uh, would go away because there's nobody paying the subsidy anymore. It's only if you have people who don't have it. So it does go away. Uh, but when it goes away, it goes away in a way, again, that leads you to income inequality. Uh, if you're rich enough to have a house on a rooftop, uh, you can do this and you benefit. If you're not rich enough to own a house on a rooftop, you don't benefit. So you, you're, you're still paying the subsidy for those who do. Now, I personally uh, think subsidies are absolutely wonderful at the right time in the cycle. If you, I think you, the governments should be investing in research and development to drive down cost. We did that wonderfully with solar panels, and then China showed us what uh, subsidies can do. They took uh, our, the solar panel technology that we developed over 15 years and subsidized an industry to figure out how to build that really cheaply. You use subsidies when economy of scale in, in production is your, is your biggest constraint to making things work. And they, picked the exact, they timed it beautifully, so they timed out a situation in which uh, they, could, uh, they could basically take over the, uh, dominate the world market uh, by putting the subsidies in just at the right time. And I think it was masterful. I, uh, and I think you, you, that's using subsidies in the right way. But, but, that's, we, but we're still using them, and we need to understand what we're doing. And that brings me to the last slide, and where I'm putting it back is into your challenge. Um, I think it's a given that reliable and affordable and ubiquitous electric power is critical for the functioning of the world. We need this. Um, it was a front burner issue. Uh, for the first half of the 20th century. We realized that people were having a terrible standard of living uh, in the United States, and we were going to fix that. We still have billions of people who have that terrible standard of living around the world, and we haven't fixed it yet. And I think that's uh, something we, we really need to be talking about and doing something about. But we also have our own problem. The technology is changing, so the grid is changing. In addition to that, the legacy grid is getting old. We're going to have to replace it, and we're going to have to replace it with a new technology. So the, the challenge is not... I, there, there's not a silver bullet. There's not, this is the right answer. All these are wrong answers. The problem is, is in Austin, there's going to be one answer. In Minneapolis, there's going to be another answer. In Seattle, there's going to be another answer. Sierra Leone, there's going to be another answer. In Bombay, there's going to be another answer. Uh, it, it, you, we've got to figure out what that combination of answers are and to get answers that are really good to get people power at an affordable cost, reliably, and in a way that does not exacerbate income inequality. As I was talking to some folks before the talk, uh, we have have learned throughout history, uh, think French Re Revolution, uh, is you don't stop income inequality, you're going to kill yourself. And we've got to get, we have too much income inequality in the world now. Uh, electricity helped bring that, uh, uh, bring more people out of poverty. 
Uh, people are coming out of poverty today. I mean, poverty is less uh, a serious. I just heard uh, Bill Gates give the, the talk on how much we've improved the people who are in serious poverty. So we are making uh, advances. Let's not kill those advances by making electricity uh, something that's only good for uh, uh, the rich people. So we really got to fix it. It's not a simple answer, uh, but success is critical. And that's why uh, those of us who are doing uh, energy at the uh, University of Texas at Austin want you folks to be able to walk away from here when you graduate and be the ones in your families and in your PTAs and your towns, your, the uh, state and the nation and your companies that says, look, we really need to talk about this. We need to get it right. We need to do it better. Let's not just uh, uh, A is bad and B is good. Let's find out what really works and try to make it work. So I hope that I've, I've put a little bit uh, more into your mind that when you walk off this campus as a graduate, you'll be able to say, yes, I understand the complexity and the importance, and I'm going to do something about that. And with that, I thank you for listening, and I welcome any questions. Bob, I always get the first question. Uh, excellent presentation, by the way. I like the way you frame the argument and the discussion and try to categorize, especially the low cost, the reliability, and reducing inequality as the three metrics we sense in the utility industry today. I think with the gross generalization, the fourth new metric seems to be, in many parts of America at least, there's a new metric of low environmental impact and more specifically low carbon CO2 impact that a lot of people are trying to internalize as a fourth new desirable goal we're trying to achieve here. And then that is often laid on top of, well, solar PV, whether utility scale, commercial scale, or residential scale, is a way, a way, one of many ways to do that. And that's how we've kind of socially pulled that in now and subsidized it and included as part of that rate to get there. Uh, what I want to know is if you kind of agree with that construct, that's kind of the fourth new metric, and if so, how does that change your whole calculation a little bit as to the value of whether it's residential or commercial scale rooftop? Um, that's a great question, and I agree, but I disagree, which is sort of normal. Uh, the, I agree that the, uh, the, the uh, emissions and CO2 is a serious problem, and it's, uh, we, we need to fix it in utilities. In my mind, I put that into cost. And that's either direct cost to the customers or the socialized cost where we put it on. We make you pay for it anyway, but it depends. We make the people who are hurt most by it pay the most, uh, which I don't think is a good answer. Uh, so, yes, I think it, it goes into the cost. Uh, in other talks, I've had uh, different uh, thrusts. I, I, I very carefully spend time to do that. I just took it out here because I managed to end in 45 minutes within seven seconds. So, but your, your point is well taken. I completely agree with you. I actually think that... Uh, uh, and I, the, the, this idea of the larger scale, scale solar uh, is, a, is a better idea than rooftop solar. I think it can get, uh, I mean, if, one of the things that I think is, is very interesting is if the utility owns the solar, uh, you get this benefit distributed to everybody. If we say that you're going to own the solar, then it, the benefit, you get more benefit than everybody else does. We say, well, that's a good thing. I really liked the experiment, and I don't know if it's still working, that... Uh, I keep calling it City Public Service because I'm old. San Antonio CPS, uh, where they owned the solar panels, and they paid you for using your roof. I think that may be a model that, if we could figure out how to do it well, might be a good model that we could use that, doesn't, that actually helps us on income inequality, uh, actually helps the people who own the solar if they, over the long term and keep solar going. But I think we're going to need the larger scale uh, run by the utilities is probably going to give us a better answer. Uh, than the, uh, than the one, uh, millions of one-off on uh, suburban houses. But we'll have both. Thank you. Thank you so much for your insights so far. Just in a relation to the rooftop question with what's going on in California where we're starting to see the requirement for this laid in at sort of a community development layer where, you know, California, I think, put a specific amount of money in for the conversion of existing houses to have PV installed on them, but apparently now has some statewide regulatory issues of requiring PV to simply be put in on all new houses. Um, it's an interesting perspective of how that regulatory question is sort of moving into a much more political realm, um, but I'm wondering what you've seen in terms of cost impact of that, especially in a deregulated 
mark out of California? That's, yeah, California is a very, for those of you who, don't, who aren't aware, California has stepped out ahead of the world in uh, saying that what we're going to do is uh, uh, go to um, uh, carbon free and we're going to go to lots of renewables and we're going to set up the infrastructure to make that happen. As you pointed out, one of the things is, is pre-wiring everything uh, to work in that way. I think that um, it's, uh, it's, a very, uh, and it's a very interesting question because we had about a 25 minute discussion about that at a uh, seminar here on UT yesterday. Uh, I, and I'm firmly on the side that I think that's a wonderful experiment. I think it's going to fail. I think it's going to fail because we don't really know how to do it right, uh, but somebody's got to try something. I think it better fail because I think it actually, the way it's structured, is it's going to take, it's going to make rich people richer and poor people poorer. Uh, I, that I think is the thing they've left out of this. They haven't figured out how to do this in a way that brings the people who can't afford a house in California already up there. They're making it worse, not better. But I think we, it, 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 it's, they've gone into a question, we have to solve this problem. And they've got this problem over here too. And I think what we have to do is say, we've got to solve all these problems simultaneously. I mean, one of the things that I learned when I became a senior manager, I really wanted something done at my organization. And I, uh, my CFO came in, sat down at my office, closed the door, and said, uh, you're screwing up. And I said, okay, what are you talking about? He says, if you want it bad, you get it bad. I think what California has done is they really badly want to have uh, uh, this, to be the world leader in renewable power. And I think that they've done it, they haven't taken the time to think it through, to discuss it, to socialize it in such a way that they can do it in a way that's good. But I give them great credit for taking the first step, and I think they're going to lead other people into doing it even better. And that's a good thing. So how's that for, I, I think it's a good thing, but I'm glad I don't live in California. <laughs> they did the same thing with electricity deregulation. California showed us how not to do that. No, not, right, so yes. Texas could then do it correctly. <laughs> right. Well, it's hard to be first. You've got to give them a little credit for that. I mean, it's, it's tough to get out there when there's, there's no path. If you see where somebody fell off the cliff, you say, well, I'm not going over there. There's a cliff. Uh, so that, that helps. So that's why I say I'm glad you're doing it, but I'm glad I don't live there. Come on. I'm approachable. I'm easy. Okay. Well, thank you very much.